Hello everyone and welcome to the STEM high level event bringing research into the classroom. My name is Noel Billon and I'm coordinating European School Net's activities in the Brightech project. You will hear more about this project during the event today, but first let me introduce briefly who is in the room. Together with us today in the online room, we have my colleague Rute Batista, who will be supporting this event from a technical point of view. So if you have any issues with your audio or connection, please do not hesitate to send her a message in the question and answer window. But most importantly, it is with great pleasure that I will soon be welcoming our speakers for today, who are researchers, teachers, but also representatives of STEM organizations and companies from different countries in Europe. They all agreed to share with you their experience or research findings about citizen science and how these activities can be integrated in the classroom. Thank you so much to them for being here and presenting today. Now let me continue with some technical aspects. The live event is recorded and we will publish the link to the recording on the Brightech platform, as well as on Scientix and STEM Alliance portal. You will also see a question and answer window in your screen. If you don't see it, make sure to open it because we will be sharing useful information and links with you there throughout the event. Also, as this is an interactive event, please feel free to share your questions to speakers in this window. We will be collecting them and address them to speakers towards the end of each presentation. The Brightech and some other projects co-organizing the event today are financed by the Erasmus Plus program. For the event to be considered eligible, we must provide to the European Commission the full name and address of all participants. So for this, I can ask you to go to uh, the chat and to sign the participants list of the event. We'll actually share the link that is shown in the question and answer panel. So this will only take you two minutes to fill it in. As you saw, five different projects are actually co-organizing the event of today. Brightex, CS Track, STEM Lion, Scientists, and Amgen Teach. And all of them are very active in STEM education and bringing their research and education world closer together. So during these two days of event, our speakers will share innovative practices regarding citizen science in schools, provide insights on how schools can collaborate with research centers and universities, share tips from key stakeholders involved in education on how to engage students into multidisciplinary citizen science projects, discuss with you necessary conditions and types of practice leading to effective implementation of citizen science in schools. You will hear more about all these projects that I just mentioned before during these two days of event. But now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mark Durando, the Executive Director of UPenn SchoolNet. Mark, welcome to the event. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Noel. Uh, I hope uh, everybody is hearing. Can you confirm that the sound is good? Yes, okay. uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to to have the opportunity to, to welcome all these 800 participants from more than 20 countries to this STEM high level event, which will deal, as Noel was mentioning, with a very important topic regarding the STEM education area, namely bringing research into the classroom and developing this concept of citizen science into our classrooms in Europe. We have representatives from ministries of education, we have teachers, we have researchers which are with us today and I'm sure the exchanges will help us to better understand and better uh, uh, develop all this citizen science approach for the future. The event, this event is directly related to the importance for developing new approaches for making science teaching more attractive at the level of our young students. Europe's shortage of STEM skill labor force is quite well documented and the lack of STEM skill labor is predicted to be one of the main obstacles to economic growth in the coming years. Furthermore, most European countries are lagging behind in international educational studies such as PISA and TIMSS, particularly in areas such as science, mathematics 
and reading, even if reading is not necessarily on, on the, the center of our topic today. In this context, there is a real need for innovative approaches, increasing the motivation of pupils towards STEM topics, and for offering teacher training into new ways of introducing science into the classroom. Additionally, there is still much work to be done in improving the image of scientists at the societal level. That is why initiatives that help demystify science and which connect pupils with real scientists can create a long lasting positive impact with regards to, the, to this image of inaccessible scientists. Moreover, connecting schools with the world of research is essential in ensuring that the research sector will benefit of much needed new talent in its various fields and that students are sought to think like scientists and it's a very important dimension. Waiting evidence to draw conclusions and learning how to navigate the claims and counterclaims bombarding us in our everyday lives. And we have very good example of such a situation in this current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, and it's absolutely essential that uh, students can understand better all the evidence uh, provided by the research area. An additional impact is foreseen at the level of universities and research institutions who have the chance to present themselves as active players in local communities, supporting young talent, contributing to scientific advancements and taking a real interest in local issues. As a network of 32 ministries of education, European Schoolnet received the mandate from its ministries of education to reflect how we can fight against this disinterest of young students for taking up STEM studies and later on taking up STEM jobs. Through our various projects, among which Brightech, we are developing activities enabling us to collect evidence and data on which our ministries can base policy recommendations. Scientix, the community of science education in Europe, funded by DG Research, is one of the flagship initiatives managed by European Schoolnet. There are also other initiatives such as the STEM Alliance, a public-private initiative associating both ministries of education and companies in order to work and reflect about the importance of contextualization of STEM teaching and contributing, therefore, to make science teaching more attractive. All our various STEM activities at European Schoolnet are addressing four strategic areas. First, the STEM pedagogical approach is working on teaching STEM in an integrated way. Secondly, exploratory actions following up on different topics like citizen science, space education. Sustainability education projects such as ocean literacy, forestation and climate change. Emerging technologies such as, for example, educational technologies and augmented reality in education. We also have transversal projects and transversal activities such as developing and supporting even better inquiry science based education in a certain number of sectors and some cooperation with private sectors such as the Amgen Foundation are also helping us in order to develop those type of activities and awareness vis-a-vis -vis schools and teachers. We are noticing three recurrent factors concerning the situation of STEM education in schools in Europe. The first one is linked to curriculum and for the time being curricula are overstaffed with factual content and more and more topics are added while very few are removed. And we notice this curricula issue even more in this current emergency remote uh, uh, teaching activities which had to be put into place from one day to the other during the pandemic. And one of the main question is when we have to change the way of delivery of teaching, whether the curricula should not be revisited as well. The second aspect is the pedagogy, which continues to be text-based and organized around factual recall. Whereas exploratory learning modes, such as inquiry-based science education, are not developed enough. And we see that even more importantly, 
more exacerbated by the distance teaching uh, development which took place in this last period where it is absolutely essential to find innovative pedagogies in the science education area. Finally, the relevance of content to the pupils' lives and future careers is an element of concern. Pupils fail to see how STEM relates to society current, current challenges, such as climate change, energy and other topics. That is why we have worked on the Bright Tech project, bringing research into the classroom, as all these new citizen science education approaches are essential for our science teachers and contribute to this better attractiveness of science teaching at the level of all our young students. All along these two days, we left testimonies and presentations from various education stakeholders, and we will be presented the Citizen Science Toolkit, as well as recommendations for a better implementation of citizen science in the classroom. We'll also have the opportunity to discuss recommendations for citizen science in schools for our decision makers. I would like to take the opportunity of opening this STEM high level event to thank all the Bright Tech partners for the heavy work they did all along these last years. And I wish you a fruitful event all along these two days. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mark. And uh, yes, as you mentioned, you and I've been involved in more than 30 STEM education initiatives tackling the issues and challenge that uh, uh, you mentioned, financed through European School Not Members, industry partners, or by European Union spending programs. But now I will pass the word on to Dr. Agata Kotsik, coordinator of Brightech. She has worked as a coordinator of huge educational initiatives, both at national and European level. And she will tell you more about the importance of bringing research into the classroom and what do we mean also by science, by citizen science education. Thank you very much, Noel, and good morning, everyone. Um, today we will speak a lot about citizen science, but mainly in the context of including that uh, this kind of initiative in education and therefore bringing research uh, into the classroom. Mm. I hope the slides will be moving. Um, so a few words about um, citizen science. Uh, when we when appropriately designed, citizen science can work on massive scales, giving scientists access to amounts of data otherwise difficult to obtain and generating research outcomes increasingly accepted by the scientific community. So this one sentence is uh, very nicely describing the citizen science uh, power. Uh, what, what do we mean by citizen science? It's quite often called participatory science or community-based participatory research. And it's a relatively new way of conducting citizen research by enlisting the support of ordinary citizens into collection of and interpretation of large amounts of data. Uh, the definition of uh, citizen science may be quite broad. Uh, for instance, it may include uh, such actions as citizens' direct collaboration with citizens uh, through science popularization activities uh, and to crowdfunding initiatives related to scientific research. Uh, in, our in our case, in the Brighton projects, we mainly uh, took uh, quite robust uh, definition, so we concentrated on the citizens' direct collaboration with scientists and namely schools' collaboration with scientists. Um, European Citizen Science Association uh, in 2000 was In 2015, uh, European Citizen Science uh, Association um, prepared some principles for citizen science initiatives and uh, they were published in forms of 10 principles and what is important here that citizen science projects should generate new knowledge uh, or understanding and they have a genuine science outcome so taking this more robust set of guidelines uh, we see that science popularization activities or crowdfunding uh, initiatives are not uh, fulfilling the, the definition. Uh, 
I encourage you to, to read more about, about this in our report. I will show you later. And um, we also know that there are various forms of citizen science projects from contributory uh, via collaborative and up to co-created, which are uh, the best solutions for both parties because both parties are really engaged in the process from defining the questions, then the next step, gathering information, developing hypotheses, discussing the result and answering together some new research questions. Um, here is our report, Bringing Research into the Classroom. This is a Scientix Observatory publication produced uh, jointly by Scientix and Brightex, and uh, it provides baseline for understanding the key conditions of successfully implementing citizen science, how we engage volunteers, how schools and researchers uh, collaborate uh, in such initiatives. And there are also um, national examples of citizen science initiatives run in partners' countries. Now I will focus a, a little bit more on uh, what uh, this bringing research into the classroom gives to students, to teachers and to researchers, because they were the main three groups uh, that were collaborating together within the project project. So I believe that students are benefiting a lot thanks to being exposed to all steps of scientific inquiry. Uh, it also helps them understand uh, complex conditions occurring in nature and participation in real life science practices um, help, help them perf better perform in science and understand how science works. Also practical hands-on activities um, may stimulate faster learning and cognition. So as Mark Durando said a uh, few minutes before, we are trying to shift from this factual learning into hands-on activities, into inquiry and into um, engagement of students' various senses and activities. Uh, as for teachers, what, what is the role of teachers in, in such collaboration? Definitely they need to motivate students to participate in the project. They supervise the process of collecting and analyzing data and they do the first quality check to make sure that the data uh, taken by, by students are accurate and uh, the whole methodology is correct. Uh, they are also facilitators in the communication between students and the professional researcher. As regards researchers, um, such collaboration helped them to save time in looking for volunteers, but also on the other hand, as uh, non-professional um, participants are included in, in the scientific uh, process, uh, some extra effort and time is needed for proper training of teachers. Uh, this is also a good opportunity to collaborate with local communities, especially if we have schools um, in various regions of our country, then reaching through reaching to teachers and students, we also reach students, parents, uh, grandparents, uh, friends, etc. So the local community is well informed and interested in scientific research conducted in this in this region. It's also a, a way of communicating research. It aims and uh, importance to society. In the Brightec project, uh, we were acting in a consortium of six partners from uh, four countries, Poland, Belgium, Greece and Spain. The collaborating groups were researchers, teachers and pupils. And the main outcomes are the report on citizen science guidelines for teachers, teachers and researchers, citizen science toolkit, a massive online course uh, based on science pills, videos and lesson plans developed within uh, pilots, and recommendations for decision makers. What were the aims and outcomes of Brightec? So first, supporting the exchange between research institutions and schools. Um, and as an outcome, we had a community of practice for teachers and researchers. Uh, another aim was to co-create and pilot citizen science initiatives in schools, which were run at the national level. Uh, thanks to documenting of experiences, we, we developed uh, citizen science toolkits, uh, uh, videos and lesson plans, and also guidelines and resources as examples of good practice in implementing citizen science at school. And uh, 
The, the last aim was to provide online training for teachers and recommendations for stakeholders in engaging schools and research into joint initiatives. And as the outcome, I will mention here MOOC course and report on best practices for stakeholders. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Agata, for this introduction to Bright Tech and citizen science education. And as we could see also from your presentation, the success of a good citizen science activity in the classroom lies on the collaboration between teachers and researchers. In this regard, let's look into this collaboration a bit further with Franca Sormani, teacher of mathematics and physics, but who has also many other hats, among which e-twinning ambassador, scientist ambassador, and member of the Pedagogical Advisory Board of Bright Tech. She is also involved in teaching training at um, the University Degli Studi di Milano. Franca, I'm aware you're also involved in research and learning processes, particularly inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, and challenge-based learning, and in innovative pedagogical practices with special regard to gender differences. Thanks for being with us today and for sharing with us some insights on how from a teacher's point of view and your exper extensive experience with today's topic, we can start the collaboration with research centers and universities. Franca, the floor is yours. Um, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. As um, the previous uh, speaker pointed out, the citizen science uh, education in the classroom is very important for many reasons. So it's vital that school uh, and teachers start cooperating with uh, universities and uh, center, uh, research center. But how? Oh. Oh. Basically, there are two approaches, search for international already existing project or search for collaboration in a local project. It has to be said that the citizen side is becoming, uh, is becoming a must have. Indeed, public participation in scientific research is getting more and more crucial to society and the research itself. So we can find uh, a lot of program on, uh, on uh, internet and uh, it's easy to find uh, a project uh, for teacher in line with uh, the subject, school curricula, age of student and so on. And, uh, and uh, it's simple to turn a citizen signed uh, program into project based learning experience uh, most suitable in the classroom. But uh, uh, the partnership between school and university uh, will be only virtual, also without pandemia. And um, you have to to, to pay attention to the effective um, use and transparency of um, data management. In this context, I show just a light sun website entirely dedicated to citizen science. You can find the list at this, uh, this um, link. Uh, maybe in addition to Bright Tech, of course, uh, the most popular are the Universe and uh, uh, science, science Starter, which are very similar with projects uh, that cross uh, disciplines uh, and where students can create uh, their own uh, citizen science project to add to, add, uh, to the side. And, but uh, of course, uh, you can find uh, citizen science project also in the usual most important science website like NASA, ESA, and so on. But uh, if uh, school or individual uh, or individual um, teacher have uh, ideas, goal, project uh, about some topic. Uh, they can ask to near university or research center to develop a collaborative program. 
in uh, this case uh, is uh, possible to start from local real life problem and the collaboration with uh, university and uh, research center is close and effective for uh, all the stakeholder and the student, teacher, researcher and community. But uh, it could be very demanding for teachers. I had experience uh, in both uh, in both of these uh, this way, but uh, now you would like to present uh, example on local uh, local uh, uh, project uh, even in uh, a international contest. The end was uh, an Erasmus Plus project uh, along uh, seventh European school about uh, the effect of uh, human activity on natural disaster. Each pattern had to focus on local problems. So in my area, Lombardy, um, our investigation were about uh, hydrological instability, uh, which uh, is uh, mostly related to mountain issues uh, like uh, permafrost or glacier melting. So we contact the university and uh, student had uh, the opportunity to work uh, on this problem um, and uh, studying uh, imaging from satellite or uh, do uh, field research uh, in collaboration with uh, the researcher of the uh, university in uh, Milan, in Subria, and also Un Unimont, which is a center of uh, excellence. Uh, in addition, Studio also organizes uh, conference and activity to engage uh, their communities and work with uh, civil uh, protection. Uh, BRICS is uh, a no spin off of um, the end, focus on uh, the effect of climate change and uh, on the resilience of uh, these e effects. Students work again on mountain issues, but also on sea problem in a city design project led by University of Bologna. Uh, beside the collaboration with uh, you in collaboration with Unimon, student had the opportunity to participate in uh, many international competition. Maybe the most important was uh, in uh, occasion of uh, uh, EUSALF uh, forum. Uh, students were invited to develop innovative high impact ideas, project service it's, um, of meeting international requirement and presenting uh, their own uh, responses. The winning project, the winning project uh, are supported by university and uh, ministry. So, in conclusion, uh, the collaboration allowed to achieve important goal and uh, was very fulfilling for uh, students, teacher, researcher and uh, community. So, you just have uh, to find uh, and join your citizen design project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Franca. And we actually have one question uh, uh, in the chat. Um, so maybe you can also share your insight about this. Is the collaboration between students and researchers part of a school's curriculum or is it an enrichment activity, according to you? Um, is uh, no, is part uh, I present it is not part of uh, my institute um, program, but uh, I introduce uh, in my program this uh, collaboration uh, in uh, all my classes. Depending on the classes, so I, I, I search uh, 
for uh, already existent uh, uh, already existent uh, project oh, we develop uh, this uh, project in collaboration with near university which is uh, the more effective but uh, i as i said is very demanding Thank you, Franca, and I believe these examples really uh, will be helpful for teachers attending the event today and who are willing to organize citizen science activities in, uh, in their classroom. Um, as you might have noticed from the presentations today, citizen science uses different pedagogical strategies. One of them is to engage students via inquiry-based teaching strategies. And in order to talk a bit more about the pedagogical strategies behind citizen science and how it can bring added value to students' learning, I'd like to give the floor to Annette Condon from the Amgen Foundation. Uh, I'm Annette, you're with us. Hi everybody, um, I'm very honoured to be here today. I represent the Amgen Foundation, so for those of you not familiar, Amgen is a leading biotechnology company um, and we have a strong presence in Europe with research organisations and manufacturing, but I represent the philanthropic side of the company and um, science is part of our DNA, so science education is a cause very close to our heart. I'm just hoping the slides advance. I seem to be having some problems. Here we go. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. So, you know, I think over the last year we have seen that the world needs scientists more than ever, but not all students get the same opportunities to learn. And meanwhile, science and technology continues to advance at an ever increasing pace. And we know from speaking with teachers that it can be challenging for, for teachers to keep pace with those advancements. And we've all seen that COVID-19 has really upended our educational system. Um, widening the gap in terms of um, educational systems, uh, particularly amongst underserved communities. Um, and to combat these rising inequities and barriers to science education, the Amgen Foundation develops high quality programs and tools to support teachers to reach students, irrespective of income, uh, gender, race, or location. And today, I want to talk to you about two programs. One, a long-standing program, Amgen Teach, um, which uh, is based in Europe, and the other, a global online platform that was just established last year. <sighs> Apologies. So the Amgen Teach was a program was established in 2004, working with um, national training providers in 10 countries and European Schoolnet, and sponsored and supported by the Amgen Foundation. Um, and the program has been running for quite some time, um, and it's gr gratifying to see that 99% of teachers participating would recommend Amgen Teach to colleagues, and a large number, 83%, said that they had increased their knowledge of IPSI methodology. Before the course, only 30% of the teachers were confident and had used IPSI in the classroom, but after training, nearly 80% said they would. Um, and we feel these results um, are very important. Uh, Inquiry-based teaching is more challenging for teachers, and really this program has been about empowering teachers and giving them the confidence to um, invest in inquiry-based learning in the classroom. Um, thus in, in transforming the overall learning experience for students. So we really see teachers as the catalyst for change. I think we all remember the inspiring teacher when we were all going to school. So if you have an inspiring teacher in the classroom, they have the opportunity to touch the lives of thousands of students over the course of their career. 
So our overall learnings is inquiry based science education plays a huge role in the classroom, making science education interesting, engaging and fun, uh, showing students that science is not a dry subject confined to the textbook, but something that's living and breathing in our world around us. What we discovered as well in Anjun Teach is um, the program started very much doing face-to-face uh, -face training, but over time we've added distance learning events. Um, we've also obviously did a very, um, a very uh, a successful MOOC, which was transnational and, and attracted a very large number of people. So obviously over the last year, um, training has pivoted even more online. And I think it really proves that a hybrid model of in-person and distance events can provide very effective professional development opportunities for teachers. Um, I think teaching can be quite um, an isolating, lonely profession. You spend most of your time with the students in the classroom. So we believe teacher networking is very important, best practice sharing. Over the last number of years, Amgen Teach has set up a very successful ambassador network program, which is very important. And the whole program is centered around the importance of the life sciences. Um, one of the things that we found worked well, you know, there isn't an actual prescribed curriculum for Amgen Teach. So it's really down to each training provider in each country to decide what works locally, what teachers need, um, to develop content based on the, the national curricula that respects national needs, teacher practice and national culture. But what we felt was very fundamental to the program is to have a central evaluation framework and methodology. Um, and one of the things that we also, I think, very successfully did, we wanted to measure the success of the program so we could refine it um, and prove it on an ongoing basis. So surveys were very fundamental to the program where we asked teachers in advance of training and post training so we could measure the impacts. So the overall evaluation, um, not just based on surveys, but also interviews was very fun fundamental to the success of the program. Um, together with European Schoolnet, we were very keen to capture best practices and our learnings. And so we sponsored a report that covers not just Amgen Teach, but other key science education programs. And the idea was to document our learnings to inspire perhaps other funders, um, other NGOs setting up a program. What had we learned? You know, let's not replicate the, the wheel. Let's learn from each other. And really the report highlights the need for continued teacher support and showcases the very important role teachers play in fostering not only the innovators of the future, but also um, corporate citizens, citizens of Europe that value the importance of science and understand the power of science in all our lives. Currently, Amgen Teach is also working with European Schoolnet and Scientix, uh, supporting an international survey on teachers' practices and use of the te technologies during COVID. So the idea is to ask them about the problems they encountered, the solutions they implemented, and their recommendations for the future. Um, and that survey will be available in the near future. I wanted to switch attack and talk a little bit about um, uh, a program that was just established um, in 2020 it actually launched in January and we had obviously no knowledge of what was coming down the tracks in terms of COVID. Uh, we were had already were, were well advanced in our plans, but it's effectively a free online community uh, for learning, sharing and collaboration developed by Harvard and sponsored by the Amgen Foundation. And we feel that this fits very well into the whole notion of citizen science because it's about connecting students and researchers. It's a very powerful platform for teachers because you can go in and add your own content, select content from different locations and build your own learning pathways. So you can personalize and customize your pathways. And the idea is really science is for everyone. Everyone is for science. It's about creating opportunities for success in science for anyone, anywhere. 
Um, and in a very short period of time, we have over eight, over 8 million users worldwide, and it features educational assets from over 100 collaborators. So I'd encourage you to go on and take a look at uh, labexchange.org online. So, um, so just to explain, in 2020, 46% of the content on Lab Exchange was created by educators. And the team ran 65 workshops for educators, created over 40 interactives and 13 simulations. So one of our other Amgen Foundation programs, Amgen Biotech Experience, which is available in a number of countries in Europe, including Ireland, the UK, Netherlands, France, Germany and Italy. Um, we took content from there called Foundational Concepts and Techniques in Biotechnology. And we basically, with the support of Harvard, we converted that content online. And this cluster exposes learners to key um, concepts and lab procedures in biotechnologies. And there's 11 unique digital pathways and it's available in uh, 12 languages. Um, and uh, there's, there's an educator tour available um, and I'm just showcasing here a little simulation around micro pipetting. So this has proved very valuable during the COVID-19 pandemic, but teachers tell us that this is also valuable for when we return to the classroom. This could be, for example, used uh, as a preparatory um, course for students to do before the lab session. Um, and also could be very valuable in terms of revision techniques. So um, without further ado, I just want to say thank you for listening to me. Thank you for your attention and I wish you a successful two days of collaboration and learning during this event. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, for the inspiring talk. And now that we actually looked at some theoretical aspects behind bringing research in the classroom and how teachers can collaborate uh, with a research institute, let's hear the, the feedback from a practical case study that was run under the Bright Tech project. Um, thank you, Adrian Colerizo, for being with us today. Adrian is a secondary education teacher and he will tell you about his experience on how to engage secondary education students into a multidisciplinary science project. Adrian, are you with us? Hello. Hello. Well, yes. the floor is yours. Hello. Welcome to the event. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. I'm really, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really happy to be here sharing my experience using citizen science projects in the science classroom. I'm currently working at the Escuela Ideo, which is a school based in Madrid, and I'm teaching physics and chemistry, but also technology. So I will try and give a multidisciplinary view of citizen science projects and how I have implemented some of them in, in my classroom. Okay. Um, I'm trying to move on. Yeah, here it is. So the first thing is uh, that one may have the question of why uh, implementing STEM projects in the classroom? Why choosing this um, this strategy or why choosing this uh, methodology? Well, the first thing is that uh, STEM projects engage students in science learning, which is really important. They also make learning more meaningful and also more, more lasting. In, if we stick to the to the curriculum and use a, a different instructional strategy, uh, we may lose some students in the way. Uh, but on the contrary, if we do a project, and in particular a citizen science project, we will make this learning more meaningful and, and well, students will be uh, really motivated and engaged in the, in the classroom. We will also encourage skill development, mainly through uh, inquiry-based inquiry learning and, and these kind of strategies. And Last but not least, we will uh, link the curriculum to real world experiences, which is really, really important for students. They must, um, they need to see that what they are learning in the classroom is connected to their everyday life. So these uh, were some of the reasons why I would uh, suggest to use STEM projects as a, a good strategy for science learning. And why citizen science projects? Well, from my experience, citizen science projects in the science classroom help us to introduce students into the process of science and the scientific method. 
In Spain, the process of science uh, is part of the national curriculum in every year of secondary education, but um, we usually, uh, teachers usually try to find a, a more like a, a different strategy and an instructional strategy, which is different to a citizen science project. But from my point of view, and when I was introduced to citizen science, I discovered that uh, this is a very good way to introduce students into a real uh, scientific practice and into a real uh, example of the scientific method. We will also um, help develop positive attitudes towards science among students. As the last speaker just said, uh, the world needs scientists. And there's um, evidence that uh, attitudes towards science are not always the best ones. So through citizen science projects, we will uh, definitely make students uh, more motivated in the classroom and attitudes towards science would be, um, would be better. Uh, through a citizen science project, we can also engage students in advanced research activities. And for some of them, this will uh, also increase their academic performance because they will see their learning as something really relevant. And finally, uh, citizen science projects from the teacher point of view, it offers us, uh, they offer us a really innovative approach to science learning and a really enriching professional development opportunities. Um, and now, again, as last speaker just said, teaching can be a lonely profession. So uh, this, uh, this is a really good opportunity to connect with other teachers, to connect with researchers and, and to open uh, our views to, to a, a, really, a really big community, which is uh, the citizen science community. So now I'm going to talk about one of the projects I implemented in my classroom, which is the self-spotting project. It's part of the Better project. The self-spotting project, or Let's Fight uh, Cancer Together, uh, is a machine learning project which tries to well, uh, use machine learning to classify microscopy images of cancer cells. Uh, the original self-spotting experiment uh, had the purpose of uh, finding chemicals that induce apoptosis in tumor cells. And well, uh, it was this project was developed at the University of Zaragoza, and the experiment, um, what they did in the experiment was testing several chemical compounds in in cells which were cultured in vitro, and to determine their effect, the effect of these chemical compounds, they use a microscopy uh, system which took pictures of the cultures every 30 minutes, more or less. So this made a, uh, they finally found that they had a really big photographic record. Uh, of what was happening uh, to the cells over time. So in just one day, they could get more than 4,000 images. So uh, another, another team uh, had the idea of using machine learning to classify these uh, images of cancer cells and finally to bring it to the classroom and make students uh, train this uh, machine learning algorithm. So this way we, we would combine biology because we have these uh, microscopy uh, cell images uh, which are classified by humans. And then we also have computer science because we have a machine learning platform, a machine learning algorithm. And through biology and computer science, we will be able to train the computer with human analysis. And the final goal is to do an automatic computer analysis. So this would be a multidisciplinary project between biology and ICT. We implemented this project this year in my school with different, with different classes, and it was a complete success. This is a picture of the um, well, of the of the website or, or the the platform where students uh, can see the images of the cancer cells, and uh, which have been treated with uh, chemical compounds, and by observing the cell images, uh, which were obtained by uh, Florence microscopy students, uh, learn to sketch and legend the main components of the cell, and they also understand the apoptosis and the necrosis processes and identify the morphological characteristics of these two types of cellular death, which is part of the official curriculum of uh, biology lessons. And they also get to know the techniques which are used in apoptosis inducing drug delivery research in, in tumor cells. So uh, how we did it, we uh, did, uh, this was the plan we followed. Uh, before starting, we had some previous lessons. These previous lessons were uh, in the biology lessons and also the ICT lessons. Uh, they were studying the cell and they were introduced to some programming languages and machine learning. They were introduced to Python uh, programming in Python language. And after that, uh, we had a lecture by the researcher, the first lecture by the researcher. Students uh, got to meet the researcher online. And after that, they, we finally we implemented the project. Uh, we did some cell analysis using cell spotting. They had to identify alive cells. They had to identify uh, cell content release, the mitochondrial distribution, 
and many other remarks. So uh, it was a, a really complete experience. They they had to spot, for example, the multinucleated cells and any aspect of the cell that they consider uh, relevant, such as uh, very large cells, very small cells, cells that didn't have didn't seem to be moving at all, uh, glandularity inside the cell. So um, they were understanding um, the. the the machine learning algorithm, uh, they were understanding that there was something happening over there uh, that was connected to what they had been learning in the ICT lessons, and they were also learning uh, biology. And after the implementation, we had another lecture by the researcher and then the evaluation of the project. Um, these uh, spots that I have marked there with the star are the things that I consider that are the key for the project, which are the lectures by the researcher. It's essential for students to meet the researcher because they feel that their project is important and it's actually helping uh, people. And of course, the implementation of the project is also essential. <laughs> this is another project, which is the Flevo, Flevo Collect project, which is also in the framework of the Bright Tech project. And we have not implemented this project in my school yet, but uh, it has been implemented in other school. It's a multidisciplinary project between biology, ICT, technology, and physics lesson, and we plan to implement it next school year. Um, this project, uh, the main goal is to build uh, do-it-yourself sunfly traps. Sunflies are responsible for for leishmania, and and well, uh, these uh, do-it-yourself uh, sunfly traps would allow us to capture sunflies and identify uh, using a microscope. Um, uh, whether the sunflies are male or female, and and do the characterization of these uh, sunfly sample that we have uh, near our school. Uh, this is a picture of us of the, a multidisciplinary work group. Uh, there's me over there, and uh, one of the teachers. Uh, the researcher is also there, and there are some also there are also some university students. And we were working together to to design the the do it yourself trap and also to design the. Uh, educational uh, guidelines of the of the project. So, what are some of the lessons I learned from implementing citizen science projects in my in my classroom? Well, the first thing is that in order to engage students into a multidisciplinary citizen science project, we should take into account several things. Uh, first of them is that extrinsic motivation and extrinsic incentives are really really important, at least at the beginning, because after that they lead to a higher engagement and they help to increase intrinsic motivation. So there must be some extrinsic motivators, which can be as simple as having a lecture with the researcher. Um, secondly, the purpose of the project should be made really relevant to the students. They must feel that it's something that affects them in some way to their lives or that is connected to their day-to-day. -day. Um, for example, the cell spotting project is evident. Uh, it was, uh, let's fight cancer together. Uh, even if what they are doing is uh, identifying um, tumoral cells, uh, which um, we, we must not lose sight and we must not make them lose sight of the final goal of the project, which is advancing in the in the fight against cancer. So they, they must have that uh, ultimate goal in mind because that way the project will be relevant for them. Also, communication between the researcher and the students is really, really valuable. Um, they will uh, really appreciate it if the researcher can go to the school, talk to them and maintain some kind of collaboration. In that sense, uh, in the cell spotting project, uh, they were in contact with Jesus from the University of Zaragoza. He's also one of the speakers. They're going to meet him afterwards, and they really, really enjoyed it. Uh, collaborative learning should be really encouraged because finally, um, science is uh, a collaborative process. So we cannot uh, teach science and make it uh, in the, an individual process when it is not. Uh, so collaborative learning should be really encouraged. And the sense of community is really, really important for the students. They must uh, feel that they are some way connected to a bigger community of people doing other citizen science projects or the same uh, citizen science projects, and they are uh, part of this community. And some of the lessons learned from uh, the teacher point of view in order to engage a teacher, which uh, can also be sometimes complicated because uh, we have uh, many things on the plate. So uh why should we engage in a citizen science project well the first thing uh we, that we should take into account to engage a teacher uh in a citizen science project is um, one of the things that i said before is communication between the researcher and the teacher this time is also essential 
they cannot work separately, they must work together in order to identify uh, common goals, which is the second point. There is a common goal, which is shared by the researcher and the teacher. Uh, sometimes a teacher will have to renounce to some of the uh, educational purposes because the project cannot um, and it cannot meet all the educational purposes and for some of these purposes we have to find another strategies and the researcher maybe has to renounce to other things which are uh, maybe um, amount of data um, quality of some of some of the data or well uh, we we have to uh, meet common goals and 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 they have to be shared an effort uh, should also be made to link this educational value behind the project with the school's educational project and the national education curriculum, which is really important. And the school organizational structure should also facilitate collaboration between teachers for planning and implementing the project. And there should stick some meetings in order to organize a multidisciplinary project, uh, some common spaces and times in order for teachers to collaborate. And finally, the researcher and the teacher should work together in the design of the evaluation of the project from an educational point of view, not only from the uh, scientific point of view, which is also really important, but also from the educational point of view. Uh, it, it should be evaluated by both of them. So thank you very much. I hope it was interesting. These are some of the lessons I learned from the implementation of these projects. And well, I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you so much, Adrian, for sharing your experience uh, with these citizen science activities from a teacher's point of view. And we actually received one comment in the chat and, and from uh, Juan Diego who mentioned that is uh, one setback while implementing citizen science uh, in the classroom is time and rigid official times table. So uh, how to deal with this constraint for the best based on uh, previous experiences? Um, do you have any tips or uh, comments uh, regarding, uh, regarding um, what was mentioned? And he also yeah, mentioned that, yeah, go ahead. No, no, the, go, go ahead. Yeah, he also about, mentioned about that uh, just to finish on the comments, similar problem happens with mandatory contents and covering them on school calendar. So how did you tackle those uh, challenges uh, while organizing those citizen science activities that you mentioned? Yes, these are definitely two of the main um, I would say challenges when organizing a, a citizen science project. This is one of the things I said that uh, there should be some common goals between the researcher and the teacher. Um, maybe some of these uh, contents from the official curriculum cannot be covered uh, fully, cannot be fully covered by the by the project, and we have, we must choose a different strategy. And but we, we can we will, we should also we should always sorry uh, try to link this uh, content with the official curriculum in order to to advance in this national curriculum and according to times uh, that was also a difficulty and well that's uh, mainly in the design and planification of the project that's uh, one of the key moments of a citizen science project not only the implementation which is the, the, the I mean it's the most interesting part mainly for the students but the design the previous part must be really really carefully planned in order to uh, in order to uh, make uh, timing possible. Thank you, Adrian, for sharing your insight You're and, and some tips. Uh, only one additional question, actually, from my side, because you mentioned a lot of. Uh, um, you mentioned that the projects, the citizen science projects that were implemented were multidisciplinary and, and implemented in collaboration with the with the several teachers at your school. So uh, I, I, I believe they are now willing to organize more of those citizen science activities. Is it part of the school culture now to to um, to continue doing citizen science activities? Yes, it is. I mean, um, in, in my school, uh, we would like to implement new citizen science projects because uh, we asked for some. That was one of the things I said. We need to have uh, some meetings, some common spaces, and some times in order to plan and design these projects. And we asked for it. Uh, the school was very happy to give us these times, and now we are uh, willing to implement new projects. We are. We have some new projects in mind for next year. So yes, we are. We have built some kind of a citizen science community inside my school. Great to hear. Thank you. 
Um, so now I'd like actually to continue with some other practical case studies that would give concrete examples to participants of the of the event today and how citizen science can be included in the classroom and also the pedagogical value behind it so with Wim van Bingenhout, who teaches at a technical scientific high school in Belgium. Wim teaches physics, mathematics, electricity, electronics, engineering and geography, so he's clearly a STEM teacher. And, and the Wim coordinated a lot of interdisciplinary environmental projects at his school, mostly about the climate crisis. So Wim, how are you today? I'm doing fine. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. OK. I don't see. Yeah, we're chasing your slides, but they should come ah. just in one ah, okay, second. Okay. So it should, it, it should, yeah, it should come in one second. I thought it was my fault. <laughs> yeah. It's too far. I have to get back. Okay. Okay, can I start? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sure. okay. So, welcome on my presentation. Uh, what to meet? Oh. It doesn't respond. Yeah, there's a short delay, but no worries. This ah, okay. should, yeah, you should be able to. Yeah, what do meteors, sound and air have to do with butterflies? But uh, doesn't work. Uh, okay, you have already introduced me, so I can skip this one. Um, so I'm going to tell you about uh, big and little uh, butterflies. Uh, thanks to Brightic Belgium, I got in touch. Um, with uh, scientists and we did three projects at our school, uh, mainly uh, sound measurements, uh, meteors and air quality. I'm going to start with the uh, sound uh, measurements in relation to uh, mobility. Uh, I did it with the fifth and sixth industrial science. Uh, and the citizen science aim is to uh, make more noise maps in rural areas. So the researcher want to have more data uh, of noise measurements in, at locations where we, our country is measuring, isn't measuring at the moment. The researcher uh, gave a lecture and explained everything to our students and I'll summarize this, uh, what they had to do. It started with a survey, so they had to to make um, um, to, to answer some questions, how they experience a noise in their own uh, street. They also had to do traffic counts on their front door, and they had to do uh, measurements with this noise sensor, sen sensor, which you see over here. And you get graphs like this one. Then they had to work with uh, government uh, graphs, and they combined all these uh, things with uh, in Excel and then had to program uh, this and they had to, but they are still doing it at the moment. Then they made such a graph. Uh, it's called a disruption function. Uh, what, there is also one student who does for his integrated task uh, an experiment about noise transmission. Here you see a uh, part of our school. The yellow is a big area where there goes lab and practical work. That are eight classrooms. And he placed uh, four sensors in these classrooms and in this area. And he made some noise in this uh, classroom. And then 
yeah, you can see that the further away from, from the noise-making classroom, the less uh, sound there is in the surrounding uh, areas. For, his own, for the practical part, he made his own uh, noise sensor, which you see over here. That's the um, package. And here you see the program uh, he, he wrote for uh, making work the whole thing. Uh, I can conclude that uh, this project uh, is, was very interesting for our students because they work with real data and it motivates them uh, enormously because yeah, they, they, they are dealing with data at, at their front door and they are very, were very curious about uh, the results. So this brings us to the second um, part, detecting and uh, analyzing meteors. I did it with the fifth industrial science uh, yeah, you can see meteors, but not all meteors, but uh, meteors leave an ion trace and they can be detected by uh, radio waves, which you see over here. And the students had to count uh, as many as uh, meteors as possible. Uh, the researcher explained everything about meteors and comets to our students. And then I developed uh, some exercises um, and the students uh, then counted the meteors on a website and they had to draw uh, red rectangles around the, the, the meteors. Okay, so it doesn't go along. Oh, not too far. <laughs> Yeah, uh, OK, as a conclusion of the meteors, I can say that some students didn't like to, uh, to do this because it was uh, too boring for them for counting uh, those meteors. Uh, but I'm glad that Brightech Belgium translated uh, my, uh, my exercises uh, to a new project. It's called Monster. It's also a citizen science project and it will be used um, next school year in several schools. So that brings us to the air quality and temperature. Uh, in classrooms. I did it with the fifth and the sixth. Oh. And um, it was the researcher uh, gave a lecture about uh, building physics, which was very interesting. Um, and the citizen science aim. Oh, uh, it doesn't respond that well. Oh, it's a pity. Oh, I'll explain. Yeah. Sorry. OK, then I'll tell this. Um, OK, it started with uh, with measuring of carbon dioxide concentration of the exhaust of some pupils. And here you see uh, yeah, what, what we did and the graphs on the, on the laptop. Uh, I won't tell any details. The citizen science aim is the following. Uh, we got some uh, carbon dioxide sensors and we measured uh, at our school. Uh, but this person is a student and for a master proof, she collected data from about uh, 50 classrooms uh, from whole Belgium um, to make, um, yeah, to determine what, what's the air quality of, the, of our classrooms. Two uh, students uh, spent their integrated task and made a comparison between old and passive building, but I will explain uh, this later uh, later on more in more details. Oh, that's strange. OK. Uh, I can say that we worked very close together with Brightech Belgium and, and uh, KU Leuven uh, because we, we used uh, their sensors but the students also made their own sensor, which you see over here. Uh, and yeah, the butterflies are appearing. So I can tell you more about the butterflies, but OK. So what the butterfly project is in fact a citizen science project of uh, University of Ghent. Uh, and butterf in Dutch, butterfly means vlinder. Uh, so it's a Vlinder project. Uh, well, the project is a, is this. Uh, 70 weather stations, which work on Oman, uh, um, yeah, 70 uh, weather stations were placed by 70 uh, schools 
in the Flemish part of Belgium. And we called this project at our school the Big Butterfly. Uh, we placed our weather station at a very unique location, which you can see over here. It's a middle, in the middle of a small lake. Uh, and I must tell you that it was quite an experience for our students to, to transport all the equipment to that platform and to install this. I'm going to show you a little movie. You must see to this student over here, uh, they are transporting the, the, the sensor and he's doing everything, not making it wet. He was wet, uh, as wet as he could be but he wanted to finish uh, the job. He was responsible for uh, for installing this and but it symbolizes the motivation and the passion and the commitment of our students during the whole uh, project. OK, how do we work? Uh, well, every year we do an uh, interdisciplinary year project with the fifth industrial science uh, and we develop a, a template Oh. Uh, which is similar to their integrated task they have to make uh, in the in the sixth. They also have to work along the scientific research method, uh, but since we're a technical school, they also must be able to explain the working of a photovoltaic uh, panel and all the sensors which measure the weather parameters. Uh, in the lesson geography, I taught them about the theoretical background and uh, the scientific research. I will explain this uh, in a moment. We divided our class in five uh, different groups and each group had to uh, examine and uh, had to um, research, did research on one common parameter, like for example, water. So one student, Mohamed, uh, compared our station, which is in the middle of a small lake, with another uh, station which was placed in a larger lake. And Milan did the same for another uh, lake and Massimo also for another lake. Other students compare, uh, did uh, research about um, heat islands uh, and the urbanization of Brussels, our capital town, uh, and other ones did research about uh, forests. They made plenty of graphs to draw their conclusions. Oh. Uh, well, we do more than stem in fact. We do the steel. Oh, it was too fast. Uh, and the A is for um, art and the L for language. And I will explain this to you now. Um, our own language is Dutch. So the thesis writing uh, is done in Dutch. Uh, the research they learn to make uh, PowerPoint presentation, Prezi movies, and, and in, in the lessons of Dutch. And at the end, there is a still ex exam. Uh, they do a presentation, and afterwards, they get an interrogation about the technology and science about their project, of course. Um, English is also important. The sources to do their uh, thesis is important. They, they, they have to write their abstract in English. And uh, last year, for the first time, they made uh, a poster uh, in English. And this year, they made a scientific poster in French. And for their exam, they do they have to present it in French and English uh, their uh, research. We're very proud of our students because they realized this uh, the past year during the complete lockdown, of course, with the help and online lessons of us. But Still, we are very proud of them. There are two. No, oh, I must hurry. Uh, there are two students which are um, still doing, uh, or also now for the integrated stock, making their own uh, weather station. But I'm going to skip. Hello, we'll be talking about. Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to skip it because otherwise. <sighs> yeah, it doesn't respond. This brings us to our other project, the small butterfly. Well, in fact, this is an, a device that our pupils have to engineer and it measures carbon dioxide, um, humidity, temperature and vox. Um, and this is how it works. Uh, here you see what I explained. Uh, they have to program the sensors 
and by uh, with a microcontroller it's sent to the cloud and they can uh, see the data, uh, the graphs on their smartphone or on a laptop. Afterwards, they can use uh, the data to do scientific research. Um, yeah, I already told you about uh, these two students. They made a comparison between our old and our new uh, building. Uh, there was no difference between the, the rooms at the first floor and the classrooms at the second floor. Um, but they found, uh, yeah, here you, you see a graph of the new building and in, in our new passive building, this is the threshold value. Red is the carbon dioxide and we stay always below it. But in the older building, that's, it's not a good place uh, to give lessons uh, because we exceed uh, the, the threshold value at a regular basis. I'm going to skip uh, some lead. OK, they also make their, made their own uh, carbon dioxide um, sensors and compared it with the professional, the Brightec, to see if they were working well. Uh, and this brings us to the art because they had a lot of freedom to make their own um, package and from there. And here you see the packages uh, the students made uh, this school year. Yes, and I, I'm going to give a little reflection about I'm going to skip this one as well. Who? Um, oh. Oh, it doesn't go along. Oh. Yeah, we also organized uh, this week was very rather busy a webinar. Uh, the students made um, presentations about their posters and made, made some little movies and we invited two um, persons for the universities to do uh, a lecture. So my conclusion, conclusion is that citizen science is really an added value uh, in the education of our pupils because it really motivates them because they can talk with, uh, because they can work with real uh, data. Okay, we have some other plans for the future, but I will skip, uh, yeah, I, my time is over. Uh, and I think that there will be no time for questions because I'm ready. Oh. So thank you. For your attention. Thank you so much, Wim. Uh, actually, as part of the the questions that some participants mentioned in the chat, um, they are curious if you use any tool that you can in to be used in the classroom for for the research that you mentioned. So, if you could uh, post uh, the links, maybe to some tools that you used, uh, feel free to comment directly on the the on the chat, and that could also bring some additional inspiration to uh, our participants today. OK, but thank okay. you so much to uh, share your experience uh, with us. I really believe it will provide some inspirational ideas for all the teachers and researchers attending the event today. And we're still hesitating about bringing research in the classroom um, okay. to provide further participants with further best practices and interesting insights. We have today with us Alexia Mikhailev Gad, a science and biology teacher, but also scientist and e twinning ambassador for Malta. As part of her study, she has researched scientific creativity in area she is truly passionate about. So today Alexia accepted to tell us more about how we can nurture scientific creativity in the classroom. Alexa, thank you uh, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me and thank you for that uh, beautiful introduction. Uh, as you correctly mentioned, still I'll be speaking about how we can nurture scientific creativity in our classroom, um, especially considering also uh, the citizen science project that we are hearing so much about today. So um, when I tried to uh, plan this presentation, I wanted to start off with um, some terms that we relate to science. So I was looking for some academic. Oh, one second. I'm having some difficulty changing the slide. OK, and um, so I wanted to look for some academic research um, in relation to words and terminologies that uh, children, students, adults, anyone really associates to the term science. And although there is so much research already, I couldn't find quite what I wanted to present. 
So ultimately, I changed my search and I literally googled words related to science. And I found plenty of websites in this case with plenty of terms, which uh, according to the publishers of these websites are linked to science. And some words included, I mean, they were really detailed, uh, the vocabulary included. There was the term balenology, which I learned is the study of whales. The word stylus, so the tool we use with touch screens that is uh, related to science. But the perception and the reality of science, uh, I think, became really evident as I went through these lists. So um, to me, and I'm sure that to most of you, words that are related to the process and the actual nature of science, such as creativity, problem solving, research, hypothesis and thinking, which we, at least I, was really expecting to be found on this list or on these lists were actually not featured at all. But for some reason, the word alphabetics, so the study of letters and the word weaponry were, according to these people, more related to science than the words that I previously mentioned. And I think this really keeps perpetuating the idea um, that science is just a body of knowledge, that it is static, uh, that it is unchanging. Scientists make all these decisions and we just have to learn and accept them. And it keeps also uh, the idea alive that science is boring and hard, which we know is not necessarily the case, as many of the speakers before us uh, were showing. When we actually think about it, um, science is inherently creative. It is within itself creative. Although we do not tend to associate creativity with science in general, when we think about it, there is no distinction really. When we identify problems, when we attempt to solve problems, when we attempt to draw conclusions from data, all this requires creativity. And imagination and creativity are therefore considered central to the nature of science and good science education cannot help but foster students imaginative and creative skills. And because creative thinking is necessary for this inquiry and this problem solving and even not necessarily problem solving in the classroom or in the science classroom, even just problem solving in our everyday life, creativity can really help make science education more functional. Let us not forget that ultimately providing activities which mimic the true nature of science and the work of scientists themselves helps inspire students to pursue careers in science, but also makes for a better educational experience. And I think before we proceed with how to integrate creative in our classroom and how to foster creativity in our classroom, it's very important to distinguish between two types of uh, creativity. So we can have teaching creatively and teaching creatively implies the educator using creative techniques himself or herself as an educator to communicate the message. So here we are seeing two images taken from the same place. This is Esplora Science Center located in Malta, and the image on the left uh, is depicting performers who are communicating Newton's laws of motion through art and through dance. Um, and that is teaching creatively. But on the other hand, uh, on the right hand side, we have teaching for creativity. And in this case, it is the students who are being given the opportunity to make use of their own creativity. And as we can see in the activity here, students are building some sort of vehicle um, and they need to integrate different materials. So they are the ones who are doing the creative thinking and the creative problem solving. So this distinction is very important, whether us as teachers are being creative or whether the students themselves. What I'm going to be describing is how to go for the second one. So how to teach for creativity. Another important thing to keep in mind is what we understand by scientific creativity. Uh, although we use the term very often, it's very important to define it clearly. And I personally really like this definition provided by Hugh and Davy, which is more like a matrix, so it's much more flexible to use. And basically what Hugh and Davy are telling us through this matrix is that scientific creativity is really a relationship between three different aspects. So we have the product aspect where you produce something as a result, and this could be a technical product such as a model. It could be scientific knowledge that the students identify or phenomena that the students identify, but it can also be the identification of a problem. 
scientific creativity also requires traits, and these are such as fluency, so the ability to give multiple options for a given statement or question, flexibility, the ability to adapt to change, and originality, so how different um, my sort of suggestion is in comparison to the others. And you also have two different processes, so thinking about more concrete and real things that we already know about, or imagination, so such as when we think of life on the planet Mars, for example, so we are using our imagination. I really like this matrix because as I am planning my activities, I can keep in mind different areas of scientific creativity that I want to integrate um, in the activities I provide to the students. Also, as we are speaking about citizen science, I think it was very interesting to me to learn that citizen science, as defined by the European Commission, is students or really individuals participating in the process of scientific research but not only in terms of contributing to data, but they can also identify uh, data, analyze data, or just observe the data. So there are different levels to which uh, our students, in this case, can contribute and participate in citizen science. And the way that I like to go about planning my activities is using a process of work. So this will be made available to you. Feel free to use it, adapt it, change it. Um, but this is what helps me when it comes to planning such activities. So I'm going to illustrate three activities. The examples I'm going to illustrate are ones which I have done or colleagues have done, so I know that they have been successful, but obviously they are just meant to inspire you and uh, help you with going about your own activities within your classroom. So this one was an example with students of integrated science in the secondary school, so about 12 years of age. And the task I wanted to achieve is in relation to citizen science was students providing data themselves. I always make sure to link to the syllabi topics which I already need to cover. So integrating and fostering creativity and using citizen science is not extra. It's not and it can be enrichment, obviously, but in this way I integrate it into what I already need to do in class. So I picked the topic of climate change and climate awareness. The tasks that the students uh, needed to do was use the IC change app. They logged in changes that they were noticing in our country in relation to climate change and the environment, etc. Then I always make sure that there is a task that enriches and uh, fosters creativity and make sure we are using the important 21st century skills. So in this case, students had to uh, choose what in their opinion is the most significant uh, problem the planet is facing right now, and they needed to try and identify why it is the most important problem, um, as well as any possible solutions to the problem. And we had a role playing sort of activity where students needed to pre pretend that they were scientists or members of an NGO who are asking for funding to receive money to solve the problem that they are mentioning. Um, so there we are really making use of creativity and communication and other 21st century skills. Something I also like to include is to enable students to produce like a little product which they can share. And this will help them with communicating what they've learned through this activity with their family with other friends, even to use it as promotion for the school and for the students. And in this case, they used presentations. The next activity was conducted by a colleague of mine in mathematics, um, and the, the colleague just wanted students to analyze scientific data, not contribute to it. She used the topic statistics, um, and therefore they used data in relation to Maltese weather and, and climate over the years, and they identified how there were changes in our country. Our country is very small. So you could use this in your region, for example, uh, to keep enriching and fostering creativity and 21st century skills. She held a debate as a conclusion to this to this sort of lesson where the students discussed different possible solutions, what the government could do, what us as citizens could do. And they also produced an article for the school magazine. So as I said, this is an activity that my colleague has done, but surely this could really be um, translated into possibly analyzing even the current COVID-19 data and trying to identify which measures or which countries implemented the most successful measures, for example. So we really can use different areas to integrate. This is another activity I've conducted with biology students. 
it was actually done in relation to the the project and the three R's and animal welfare being conducted by scientists, where basically students, um, I wanted them just to become aware of latest research methodologies so that as part of biology, they can become aware of the ethics of scientific research, not just the process, but also the ethical implications. So the task of students was to review a number of resources, of resources, excuse me, which communicated um, different replacement methods um, to animal testing in scientific research. So uh, I provided resources to the students, but students were also free to research more of their own. Students once again had to identify the replacement method to animal testing that they preferred, that they think was most interesting or maybe that they would like to see more of. And once again, I like to use role playing activities. The students had to pretend they were pitching this idea to university boards to receive funding for this method. And they also needed to produce a poster to visually communicate this new methodology uh, also to other science students in the school. So this is basically the process of work that I use that I hope could be helpful for you. But it could also be something very simple. So just last week, uh, my colleague and I, we have this activity every year. We use, uh, we speak to scientists um, in our country um, and they basically have an informal conversation and discussion with our students about um, their process in becoming scientists, etc. So it was nothing too grand. It was just scientists who are friends of ours. But one of the scientists, actually in the images, you can see a climatologist and also a paper conservation specialist. Um, but there was another scientist who was specialized in artificial intelligence. And uh, what he was saying was basically that um, his job is to study the patterns of human beings, but also animals and a lot of uh, organisms in nature show these patterns. And he gave the examples of different bees, which as they pollinate the flowers, have a pattern in their way of traveling across these flowers. And I was so inspired by this one sentence that I already know that the next year when I cover pollination, I want to integrate this research and artificial intelligence in some way. So really sometimes networking and attending activities like these and just having conversations informally can really help inspire us. And sometimes it is much simpler than we think. Ultimately, I wanted to end my presentation with this, uh, this quote by Edward de Bono. He's actually a Maltese um, researcher who contributed a lot to the area of creativity. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that activities which foster creativity are really accessible and relatable to students, even those who have diverse learning needs and who might find traditional pedagogies um, and traditional ways of presenting their work more challenging. So it creates a really inclusive classroom. As a result of this, we increase attainment, uh, engagement, even the student centered approach helps students become more motivated and they tend to understand and remember the content more. And this results obviously in students becoming more involved and more interested in the process of work. So um, really, I think this quote summarized um, how I feel about the integration of creativity in our classroom. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I hope this has helped uh, in some way inspire you to take this on as part of your uh, lesson planning. Thank you so much, Alexia, for the inspiring talk and also for sharing some tips on how we can nurture scientific creativity in the classroom. Uh, as you know, Bright Tech is, is, is one of the, the projects co-organizing the event today, and we have been uh, working with this project in providing useful guidelines for teachers, researchers, in order to inspire teachers, but also uh, researchers in collaborating together and engaging students in research activities. In this regard, and in order to tell you more about the great work that has been done the last few years, I'd like to introduce one partner representative of this project, uh, Dr. Ressus Clemente Gallardo, who is the director of Civis Foundation, a Spanish nonprofit organization promoting citizen science activities and research, and an associate professor in, in theoretical physics at the University of Zaragoza. Ressus, are you today? Are you with us? Rezus, maybe we cannot we cannot hear you. Oh, might be in a 
Yeah, you're 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 still you're muted, so you just need to unmute your microphone, and it should be working. Okay. Yes. Is it better. Now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, Thank you for being with us. Let's and the, the floor is yours. Your um, slides are not working. Uh, Yet. Yeah, there is sometimes a short delay moving slides, but it should uh, go fine. You will see there, there will be, they're moving actually. Okay, let's go. Okay, well, well it comes. Okay, uh, so uh, good morning, everybody. So, as um, uh, Noel uh, said, I am uh, um, uh, one of the uh, members of the Brightec Consortium, uh, and I'm uh, here to uh, report uh, how one part of the project has been uh, evolving, and what are the results. Uh, this thing is still not working. Um, let's see. Apparently, it says uh, I could not obtain the control. Uh, Okay. okay, can you pass it for me? Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, my colleague will move the slides for you then. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, as I was mentioning, my, my task now is to report the. Uh, uh, okay, no, yes. Uh, this uh, one of the six uh, out possible outputs of, of the uh, intellectual outputs of the, of the project, in particular is the third one, which uh, Hussein was to uh, create a set of uh, pilot projects. You have seen reported in, in the previous uh, presentations a few of them. Uh, Hussein uh, was to uh, create uh, of some materials, in particular, particular uh, science fields from the researchers. Uh, we all researchers have created one for our uh, pilot project, so I will co come to that in a minute. And also <coughs> to uh, for the teachers, they were uh, supposed to uh, prepare some uh, didactical material. Uh, in, in order to uh, present how to implement uh, in the in the school uh, the school room the the material the pilot discovered right okay so uh, please next slide uh, okay so how was uh, how were we supposed to do that okay this I, I, I'm extracting this from the original Bitec proposal uh, okay the idea was at the beginning to uh, co-create the uh, the pilot both uh, from the researcher point of view and from the teacher point of view so teacher uh, researchers and teachers were supposed to uh, come together and co-create and co-design uh, both the, the the concrete the particular uh, research questions to be addressed and how uh, those can be included in the school curriculum or to, to, to uh, offer them as, a, as an extra activity for the students, but to adapt at the, at the very end the, 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 the content for the students. So uh, then from that point of view, the output of this should uh, be uh, from the uh, researchers point of view, uh, the, the creation of these uh, small videos, five minutes more or less, uh, summarizing both the topic to be to be to be studied from the scientific point of view, and also uh, his or her impressions on the uh, interaction with the students, how from the researcher point of view had worked the, the, the project, and at the, at the same time, uh, teachers uh, created both a, a set of, di of didact didactical materials uh, to help other teachers eventually to, to, to implement that in their classrooms and also uh, a video describing the process. 
So that, that this was the, the, the original goal. Next slide, please. Um, OK, but this we wrote this uh, roughly in the summer of 2018. So uh, during so we had very bad luck. And, and OK, this this small fellow, uh, as you can find, uh, you can see in the slide, and everybody now is familiar with, with it, is COVID. And so COVID changed all our uh, society in the last uh, 15 months. And then uh, some of the pilots uh, had to be adapted. So uh, very often, OK, some of them, they were implemented before the, the pandemic arrived. But uh, some of them were scheduled for precisely last trimester, last academic year. And of course, I mean, you can imagine that many, many countries, but for instance, in Spain was completely locked. And then uh, students were, uh, schools were not working. And of course, we had to, to readapt everything. So from here, I would like to thank the, the, the teachers for their fantastic job. I mean, because they have dealt with this issue in a very, very complicated situation. And actually, even if this was asking them for, for more work uh, from the, the standard uh, workload, uh, in this situation, uh, the, the, their attitude and uh, the, the, the commitment has been really fantastic. So I, mean, I, I really wanted to thank each one of them uh, because uh, the results uh, have been impressive. OK, next next slide, please. OK, so, so then uh, uh, what I'm going to describe now is just to to try. Uh, I apologize in advance because okay, I surely will mu uh, mispronounce most of the names, uh, except in the Spanish, the Spanish ones. But uh, okay, I hope as they are written, I hope that the, you, you can recognize yourself in there. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I wanted to, to to present the report of all the the, the pilot projects uh, in the different countries. And also the, the, the researchers and teachers who have, who have been involved with, with them. Some of the teachers uh, have been involved in the uh, creation of the directing material only, and some of them have participated in the creation of the videos. But okay, anyhow, I mean, the, 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 all of them have contributed to, 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 the, to the creation of the outputs. So uh, again, uh, I would like to, to, to thank them again because uh, it's really the, the, the fantastic work they have done in, the, in this uh, terrible situation we are living. OK, so from Belgium. So from Belgium, we have three pilots. Uh, you have uh, heard part of, the, of them by the, uh, in the presentation of BIM. But OK, this is uh, the, the, the three set. Uh, it's uh, okay, a set of three, <laughs> a study of meteors using reflections of radio waves in, on ionized air. OK, this was a, a project proposed by the researchers Stein Calders from the Roger Benedict Institute for Space Aeronomy. And uh, uh, four different teachers have been uh, involved with that. It's uh, Michael Nies from OLVC plus, plus Antwerp. Uh, uh, sorry, there is a, uh, is a sorry, a sorry to interrupt you, but I'm afraid we will have a we have very limited time left. Okay. Um, but th th I think also you were about to mention that we could find also this information on the Bragg Tech website uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. regarding yeah, the different okay. uh, science yeah. bills. Yeah, OK, that's true. So uh, OK, you, you, will, you will find that uh, both the, 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 the in, in, at the I don't know exactly when, but uh, uh, all materials will be will be uh, provided. Uh, the the active material uh, constructed by each one of them, uh, and also the videos when, when they are when they are edited. Okay. So uh, again, so these are the, the three uh, uh, projects by Belgium. Uh, okay, this meteors thing monitoring some level analysis of uh, traffic related canyons in res in residential areas, and also this uh, final project of air quality. So you have uh, all the, the Participants in there. So next slide, please. Let's see if I okay. Also, then in Greece, uh, we have two pilots. One of on urban, cli uh, urban cli uh, climate and human bio bioclimate. Okay, and uh, I guess uh, Chris will be presenting uh, the, the, the uh, researcher part of, the, of that project tomorrow. Uh, analysis and then second one was analysis of student's dietary ha habits. Okay. 
uh, again, you will have all this material available in the in the in the Brectech, uh, website. And next slide, please. From Poland, uh, we have two pilots. So this this the study of the ultraviolet index, a closer look from Earth, and the small rotation, big deal. Okay, there's plant store uh, water and it inhibits drought. Okay, this is a start, uh, this is a, a project uh, involving the study of rivers. Uh, again, you have there all the participants. Uh, and, uh, I, I have profit this lack of time just to avoid uh, the exercise of pronouncing this. Sorry, uh, this is but Polish names it sounds uh, really unfamiliar for the Spaniard. For the Spaniard. Okay, and next slide, please. Uh, okay, this is the, the only one I, I'm comfortable with with names. Okay, and it's uh, and in Spain we have two pilots, and this is uh, Wallace uh, Flevo Collect. Uh, so this has been mentioned by, by Adrian in, the, in the, a few a few presentations ago. Uh, so our handmade traps to trap hand flies too effective as commercial ones. But this is where one of the pilots. The other, it's uh, also he has preferred and uh, he has been explained in uh, in some detail. Uh, it's cell spotting and scan with each a computer to classify microscopic images of tumoral cells. Okay, this uh, it was okay. I participated in this as a researcher. Okay, but uh, so th all this material again uh, will be available in the in the, uh, the um, Briotech uh, website uh, when it's ready. Thank you, uh, so, Jesus. Um, I'm sorry, but we will need to 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 move on to the to uh, the next uh, presentation as we have very limited. Uh, okay. Uh, well, time left. well, the next slide you have the final uh, quantities. Okay, that's it. It's okay. You have in total so 12 lesson plans, seven researchers videos, and nine teacher videos. So again, thank you very much to all of them, and thank you very much for your kind attention and for your patience. Thank you, Jesus. And for presenting these resources and this huge work that was done by uh, by Bragtech partners, but also teachers and researchers. Um, so in order to contribute further uh, now to the discussions around the use and role of citizen science in the classroom, the team also initiated the work on a set of uh, recommendations, which aims to evaluate the implementation of the citizen science initiatives and in schools in the partner countries and provide recommendations for universities, schools and policymakers for the last scale implementation of citizen science activities in the classroom. So in this regard, and in order to discuss uh, already the set of draft recommendation, I have the pleasure to welcome Evita Tasiopoulou from UPenn Schoolnet, who will tell you more about this. Evita, you're with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, good morning, Thank everyone. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. OK, so in the next few minutes, since we're quite short of time, I will very, very briefly introduce you to the Citizen Science uh, Toolkit, which has been put together again by the Brightect uh, project. And we will also have uh, a few minutes to also reflect a little bit and discuss the recommendations that we can offer to schools interested to engage to citizen science projects and activities. Let me see if I can change the slides myself. Yeah. Challenge. Oh, um, I don't see any arrows. Uh, OK, yes, that happened a bit too quickly. OK, so let's first have a look at the Citizens uh, Science Toolkit. So the toolkit has been made for uh, schools, uh, teachers, universities and research institutions with the main aim to offer them a set of tools which can be used, of course, to bring research into the uh, classroom. Now, instead of um, providing ready-made recipes, uh, protocols for the implementation of citizen science in schools, the um, toolkit has been designed as a reflection uh, instrument and the whole idea is that it will help uh, schools and universities to see and understand the different options that they have during the design, uh, the planning and eventually the implementation phase of um, their project. Now, in terms of uh, content, the toolkit, contain, the toolkit contains examples of different IT tools, um, reflections on how to address um, research ethics and also what are the roles and the responsibilities of the different actors within the, the project. And finally, it also offers some examples of useful resources, but also citizen science um, networking platforms that have been developed by uh, other uh, projects. If you wish to find out more, 
you can use the link, but you can also visit the Brightech uh, website and you can find um, the entire toolkit under the uh, library. Now, moving on to the recommendations. The first issue that we want to put the spotlight on is that of um, formulating um, quality partnerships. Uh, so the responsibility, of course, doesn't lie entirely on the school. It is a partnership, so the universities also have, uh, have a role to, to play. Um, so for this reason, we are actually recommending to establish right from the start good communication patterns. So make sure that there are that there are regular meetings, that there are several calendars, that there, there is a very clear understanding on uh, agreements when it comes to roles, responsibilities, uh, expect expectations. But also uh, what we mentioned there is to make sure that whatever the project is going to be, there is something in it for both uh, parties. This means that there has to be an added value for the school, of course, but it has to be an added value for the, the university, because if this is not working for some reason, at some point, this is going to jeopardize the entire project. Motivation is and engagement are going to uh, reduce and then the success of the project actually becomes quite um, fragile. Um, now, the other aspect that we wanted to bring into the attention of the schools was the fact that cit citizen science uh, has the capacity to actually promote um, and expand the pedagogical vision of a school since, as we have seen uh, through the various uh, examples this morning, it has this uh, ability to be combined and complement with different pedagogical approaches. We have seen inquiry, we have seen project-based learning, we have heard uh, also a lot about uh, um, more integrated learning, multidisciplinary learning. So this is something that schools uh, and teachers themselves, they need to keep it in mind and as a fact can also be used as uh, an argument when um, when teachers have to convince even uh, the leadership of their school, the, the school board, that there is uh, actual value in engaging in such uh, type of, uh, of projects. Finally, uh, we wanted to underline the role of the student. This is also something that we have heard from uh, Adrian uh, before in his uh, um, uh, example. Um, so what we want to achieve is maximum engagement when it comes to, um, to uh, students. And for this reason, we recommend to actually involve them um, not only during the project, not only asking them to perform very specific tasks, but involve them uh, in a more participatory way into taking decisions about the project right from the start. So they can participate in, the, in selecting the actual subject, they can bring in their own ideas, they can um, help uh, help with sort of seeing the pros and cons, what kind of actors can be brought into uh, the project. And of course, throughout the project, uh, it's uh, quite beneficial to involve them in um, small decision um, making uh, phases, making sure that they actually feel that the project is theirs um, as well. So you've heard a lot from me, so time to uh, move to some um, more reflection and I would like to invite you to um, uh, use your own perspective, your own uh, point of view, um, your own experience as well um, as someone who is interested in citizen science or you know if you have carried out already project and help us a little bit to see what other kind of uh, recommendations or even tips or ideas we can provide to schools who are interested to embark in this kind of uh, adventure. For this reason, we have present, we have prepared um, a Mentimeter for you. Uh, so in the chat, you can find the link. Otherwise, you can go to menti.com and use the code. The link is going to be faster. And there you can actually share with us your, your ideas. You have the possibility to enter more than one. So feel free to share any idea that you have, either small or more complicated, and then we can see how we can support schools better. I'll give you a few seconds. And maybe then we can switch to the results to see if we started to have any kind of input.
suspense, excitement. <laughs> Everyone is typing at the moment. Okay, let's see if we have anything. Maybe rephrase a bit. Don't be shy. Any idea is a is an interesting idea, and it can help us help schools a bit better. Okay. Well, it's not easy to ask for feedback at the end of the day. Um, in any case, I would expect that there's going to be some comments when it comes to how a school can actually accommodate this kind of uh, project. So this is something that we will try to address in the recommendations. Of course, it's something that it depends a lot on the country and on the autonomy that uh, every school has. So there is a, a balance there to be to be kept, but we have seen that there are different possibilities from the countries that we have worked with and via the pilots. We have seen that there is project uh, time for some schools. We have seen that other schools, they sort of foster now the idea of having more multidisciplinary learning. So there are some possibilities there. So these are the kind of, um, let's say, um, possibilities that we will also try to highlight a little bit more so schools can get inspired on how to approach these projects and how to, to bring them, let's say, to their school uh, teams to the school leadership, which sometimes is a little bit uh, hesitant on the um, actual value. OK, so thank you very much. Um, and with this, I think we are going to pass to the closing of uh, the day. Thank you. Thank you, Evita. All right, I think it's time now to wrap up to this event. So I just want um, to remind you that tomorrow we'll have uh, another open session from 10 a.m. to 12 a.m. And it will tell you more about citizen science activities, in particular how a school can bring research in the classroom while tackling local issues and develop more cooperation with companies as well. Uh, I also want to remind to all the members of the Ministries of Education STEM working, working Group that they have a closed meeting this afternoon starting at 1 p.m. and they can follow the instructions sent by email in order to join the event. So thank you uh, to all the participants who also I could see a lot of links shared in the, in the chat also about the citizen, uh, citizen science activities uh, implemented at, at the primary level, secondary. So feel free to, to share your experience uh, via the chat. Uh, but the recording of this online event together with the slides will be available in the following days on the Bright Tech website. And we will send a follow up email with all the details to all participants who signed in uh, the participants slits and also a feedback form so we can also hear more about your experience during this event. So thank you so much to all the presenters of today for your really interesting presentations. Um, I also think we had very interesting comments uh, in, in the chat so thank you everyone for participating. Uh, we'll have more opportunities tomorrow so to discuss the recommendations and and, uh, and go back to the mentee that Evita shared earlier so that's uh, all from my side. Uh, have a nice afternoon, everyone, and I hope to see you online tomorrow for the second day of the event. Thank you, everyone.